The Louis T. Network is powered by Music Head University. Music Heads, classes in session. Turn me up. Enroll on YouTube now. Link is in the description. Who else could it be? But me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the Command Post Live. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Man, do I have a show for you tonight or what? Uh, it's going to be lit. This is going to be a heavy participation show. So saddle up. If um, you've been locked in this entire offseason, then this is the show for you. If you're a diehard and you do a little too much with this team, this is the show for you. Okay. Uh, so we'll get into. Uh, all of that a little bit later on as we will systematically go through the um, roster and we will fill out the depth chart ourselves in order to our ourselves rather in order to come up with our biggest needs heading into the draft. We will then put those needs in order and then we'll determine what our biggest needs are as we head into uh, April's draft so because I, I honestly i feel like free agency is done now i think they've done everything that they're going to do you, you may get one or two more moves right I, i'm not saying that you won't see a um a signing here or a signing there but it won't be anything significant you know the the all of the real signings have already taken place and the last two dominoes that we were waiting to drop have fallen right we we talked about corner they got michael davis and Noah Igbenogany, I really think Michael Davis was the corner that they were after in terms of finding a guy that could start for them. Keep in mind, Michael Davis was not their first choice, right? I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Isaac Yadam was the guy that they sought after first. I don't think the numbers uh, made sense for um, Yadam's camp. And thus, he took his talents to San Francisco and ended up signing there. Uh, their fallback plan was Michael Davis um and he's here so they've taken care of corner they took care of tackle like i said i wasn't expecting a whole lot of activity at the tackle position but i was expecting at least a swing tackle my first preference was to bring cornelius lucas back i just didn't think they were going to do it so my next inkling was hey they want to get younger at that position why not yash nyman he signs with carolina so then they went and got Cornelius Lucas. And I'm like, sweet, right? And we're going to talk about Cole Luke here in a second because um, I love the signing. You know what I find very interesting is that they kind of had a feel, a pulse, per se, on their own free agents, Washington's free agents. Like, it's almost as if they knew they're not going anywhere. Like, nobody is, like, clamoring for these guys, right? That's what it felt like, at least, because outside of Antonio Gibson, none of our guys went quickly. I saw Casey Tuhill just signed with the Buffalo Bills maybe a day or two ago. Good for Casey. Happy for him. Um, James Smith Williams is still floating out there. A lot of guys. We had 21 free agents. And of the 21, we signed four of them back. And with the Cole Luke signing. So we signed four of them back. Curtis Samuel got a deal with the Buffalo Bills. So did Casey Two Hills. So that's six. Um, Antonio Gibson got a deal with the Patriots. That's seven. Um, I may be missing a guy or two. Chase, well, Chase Young, he wasn't here. Yeah, we traded him. So he doesn't count. Um, Joey Sly signed with the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's eight. Um, I think that's about it. I don't really recall too many other guys signing anywhere now. Oh, Sadiq Charles signed in Tennessee. That's nine. Um, so, yeah, you get my picture. You get the drift, right? I, it, it's almost as if they knew our guys aren't going anywhere. So we don't have to worry about them first we can push them to the back of the line we'll get to them cam curl signed with the uh the uh, rams speaking of cam curl 
put a pin in that. We'll come back to Cam Curl here in a second. But that's 10. Um, Kendall Fuller signed in Miami. And you know when I go down these rabbit holes, I just can't stop. I'm like a dog with a bone. That's 11. Uh, any more that I can think of off the top of the dome? Mm. Jacoby Brissett. Patriots again? Did we go back to the New England Patriots? I think so. Thank you, um, David Brown and Miss P. Um, so that's 12. Um, hmm. Are we missing any more? Barton to the Broncos. Thank you, Jefferson Montenegro. That's 13. So Cody Barton goes to the Broncos. That's 13. Let's see if we can get all of these guys uh, placed somewhere. Um, that's 13. Is that the last one? Feels like the last one. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But 13 of our free agents. We had 21 to start, 13 of them. And I think that number went higher because we released three guys. We released um, Charles Leno Jr., Logan Thomas, and we released uh, Nick Gates. So that number is 24, actually, free agents. Um, and 13 have signed. Four back here and nine elsewhere. So um, felt like they knew that those guys weren't going anywhere. Like, yeah, you'll be here. And honestly, our guys didn't sign outside of Antonio Gibson. Hell, even Curtis Samuel didn't sign until like the first day of actual free agency. I don't think anybody outside of Antonio Gibson signed in the tampering period as a free agent that were free agents from Washington. So it almost felt like they knew we got these guys in our back pocket. We don't have to rush on Jeremy Reeves or F.A. Obata or um, Cornelius Lucas. Like if we want these guys back, they'll be here, you know, when we're ready. Right. And, and that's what it kind of felt like Crowder as well. That's what it felt like. But anyway, um, let's talk about some social media uh, activity earlier and then we'll get to um, my reaction to Cornelius Lucas signing uh, back on board and then we'll get to the festivities of the night. So um, somebody sent me um a message a dm of <laughs> of Caleb Williams hugging uh GM Adam Peters <laughs> and he said um what did he say i forgot what he said to me but uh I, I laughed at it he laughed too he was he was being funny right he was he was having fun with it but he he sent me the eyeball emoji and um Anyway, that was his way of saying, hey, it ain't dead yet, essentially. And I said, Adam Peters is one of a thousand dudes that Caleb Williams hugged today during his um, pro day. I, I saw him hugging Keenan Allen, who he'll be teammates with uh, on April 25th. At roughly about 8, 10 or so, he'll be teammates with Keenan Allen as he becomes a, a member of the Chicago Bears. Um, I said, he, he's hugging everybody. He had a great pro day. That's what you do. There's nothing to it, right? But then I saw something that tickled me as well. And that's Cam Curl, right? And um, clearly he's his feelings are hurt, hurt. Um, his dad is out here trying to perpetrate the fraud. I got I to gotta call Greg out on this because I'm looking at Greg's tweet shout out to miss p for uh blessing me with this information because you know i wouldn't know this stuff otherwise but a lot of y'all y'all added me but she had all the tea she had all the liptons okay all of the liptons and it was piping hot so as hot as this liptons is in my cup so apparently cam curl responded to someone responding to the Adam Schefter tweet that he was going to sign with the Rams for $13 million, roughly. And that person, you know, to some effect, 
um, said, you know, six and a half. They couldn't even, you know, match that. Like we were thinking about 10, like we were, we were, you know, arguing about is 12 too much. And they couldn't even give you 10, bro. And he said, I got some stuff to get off my chest. I wish we played them this year. Essentially, he was talking about us, uh, but they don't play us this year. Uh, we played the Rams last year and the Rams did not finish in last place in their division. So hence, we do not play um, the Rams this year. So he will not get a crack at us this year while the wound is fresh. Or maybe he'll get a shot at us next year. We'll see. But um, his dad then chimed in and said, um, they actually offered us more money. And I was like, hmm, you don't say. I said, and he said, they offered us more money, but sometimes it ain't about money. It's about principle. It's about fit, scheme, all of that stuff. And I'm like, again, Cam Curl wanted to be here. And if Washington offered him, and look, I'm I'm not doubting that uh, there was an offer made to him. What that offer was, if there was even an offer made to him, what that offer was, don't know, right? What I can say is that he got six and a half million dollars per year from the Rams. If Washington made him a better offer, are you really in a position to turn that down? He wanted to be here. His feelings were hurt. I don't think that the new group was all, all that aggressive in trying to sign him, and maybe he got in his feelings about that. That could be the case. But let's not make it seem like Washington was tripping over themselves, offering you a whole heap of money. I don't think they were offering you a whole hell of a lot more than what the Rams offered you, if that, right? Because look at what the rest of the market got, okay? We already did this exercise in, in per pertaining to the market and, and what it looked like for these safeties and guys with a better resume than Cam Curl getting $7 million a year. He wasn't getting a whole you know, a whole bunch uh, more money than what he ended up getting with the Rams. So I, I'm, I'm looking at Greg and I'm like, we don't believe you. We need more people. But that said, Cam is hurt. His feelings are hurt. I figured they were. And Washington could have offered him a $7 million deal a year. Like that, Greg wouldn't be lying if that's the case, right? His dad would not be lying if that is in fact the case. Um, and he might have turned it down off of the strength of principle. I told you that I've seen it done many a times where a guy gets in his feelings because he feels like he's a part of the foundation here, feels like he should have been uh, more of a priority. I told you Greg Curl was in his feelings when uh, Cam was not celebrated on his birthday. There was no post. Initially, I think somebody went back and said that they did post, but it was late. Whatever the case may be, it, there were, the signs were there. All of the warning signs were there. Shots were fired. Okay. And I think he was, he was in his feelings. So whether he was offered here or not, whether it was more money, whether he wasn't offered at all, we'll never know. It's his word against nobody else's word because no one else is really checking for whether Cam Curl was offered. We feel good about what's here. But we'll see what happens when we ultimately get to play the Rams. Right? I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up, I like Cam Curl. And if he were still here, I'd be happy about it. But I don't, I'm not sitting up here crying over spilt milk. Like, he, he wasn't enough of a difference maker for me to be upset that he's no longer here. You know? I would have been more disappointed if they didn't bring back Jeremy Reeves, to be honest with you. I'm just keeping it a buck. He's more of an impact player on this team than Cam Curl was. I, and I'm again, I know what the PFF numbers are, okay? You, you, don't, you don't have to try to preach to me about Cam Curl's impact beyond the numbers, beyond the turnovers. I know he's a smart guy. I know he got it. 
I knew he was versatile. I knew he could play multiple positions and do multiple things on the football field. I'm, I'm fully aware. I watched the games just like you did. But I also know that he wasn't a, ma he wasn't a major playmaker. So um, I wish him nothing but the best with the Rams. <laughs> That's all I really got. I wish him nothing but the best. Um, and then there was one more thing, and this one I don't even I don't even know why I'm giving this any. You know what? I'm not even going to talk about it because it's, it's BS, and this is the time of year where that kind of BS surfaces. And oh, what the hell? Why not? I know y'all saw some of y'all saw the Terry McLaurin rumor. It was so much of a rumor that JP Finley had to go ask uh, a few of his contacts within the organization just to shut it down. He asked, he said, there's nothing to it. Zero truth to those rumors. We move on. But um, essentially for those of you who weren't following this foolishness and you shouldn't be, by the way, you didn't miss anything. Okay. Uh, Terry McLaurin somehow got swept up because the Pittsburgh Steelers are actively looking for a number one wide receiver, which I'm like, if you're looking for one, just chill, bro. It's 90 of them in the draft. Just chill and wait till April. You'll get one. But everybody wants to connect them to one of these veteran receivers. Brandon Ayuk, because we talked about that on the podcast. Obviously, the, the 49ers are going to have to make a decision on him. They did it uh, once before with Defoe uh, picking Eric Armstead. They've already chosen Debo Samuel. Are, are they going to choose him over um, Brandon Ayuk, or are they going to keep Ayuk a part of this nucleus that they've built? A lot of money that he's going to command. Don't know if the 49ers feel like spending it. They've already spent a boatload of money on that offensive side of the football. I don't know if they can afford to spend more on another receiver. So, uh, they, they, you know, they were trying to connect the dots there. Oh, the, the Steelers are interested in trading for Ayuk. And then somehow Terry's name entered the discussion. And I'm like, ah, guys, what are we doing here? Now, again, I... I didn't for one second. I didn't even blink. I saw, oh, okay, cool. And I kept pushing. Like, it's nothing here. But JP Finley saw fit to dead this rumor and, and bless his heart for deading it before it get, gained legs um, and somehow started running around like Speedy Gonzalez in the Roadrunner. And uh, he deaded it quick. Now, this, there's nothing to this. Let's go back to thinking about college basketball, okay? Cool. I appreciate that. But I just wanted to make it known. So if you see that foolishness, floating around on your on your timeline, dismiss it quickly and keep it moving, all right? Anyway, I digress. Um, so Cornelius Lucas signed to a one-year deal to be the swing tackle of this football team, which is exactly what we needed. I did not think they were going to bring him back, but as I alluded to earlier in the show, it's almost like they had the pulse of the free agents that existed here in Washington and knew that those guys weren't going to be high priority around the league, so they didn't have to rush. They'd have plenty of time to sign those guys as backup options should the first plan fall through. Those guys would be fail-safes, essentially. Um, and every single time those guys were there, probably outside of Jeremy Reeves, um, all of these guys felt like fail-safe plans. And F.A. was probably more of a throw-in. I think there's a relationship there with Dan Quinn, and he wanted to give F.A. a shot. I still don't know if F.A. is making his team or not. You know, we got 19 defensive ends at this point. So we went from no defensive ends to, like, 40 of them. So I don't know if F.A. is going to even make the squad. But I think Dan Quinn was just giving him an opportunity because he likes him. And F.A. is a good player. So – doesn't hurt that he's a, a solid uh, contributor that you could put on the back end of that uh, defensive end rotation should he be ready to go, right? But um, Cornelius Lucas felt like a guy that they just weren't interested in bringing back. But you know what I also thought about over the last couple of days is that my our timeline for these players and their timeline are two different timelines. And I think that's what I got caught up in, my timeline what I think we should be doing, when we should be doing it. There should be more urgency. Why haven't we touched cornerback? Why haven't we touched, you know, offensive tackle? Where's the urgency, right? And they were like, bro, chill, chill. We got this. Relax. You know? Uh, we're talking to Cornelius Lucas. We'll work something out. But we didn't know that, right? And so our timeline wasn't their timeline. That's what that said to me. And 
Um, it wasn't with any of our former players because I didn't see us resigning Jeremy Reeves. I thought they were going to move on from him, and I was disappointed in that decision. And then they bring him back. Um, I didn't see F.A. or Jamison Crowder coming. I'm not leaving on front. I didn't think either one of those guys were going to be back. And then I didn't see Cornelius Lucas happening because it took so long to materialize. I just figured they're going in a different direction. And then I started to see the swing tackle market dry up. And I'm like, well, what are we waiting on? If you're not bringing back Cornelius Lucas, get what are you doing? Get in there. Get a guy, right? As the Jermaine Illuminors and Yash Nyman started to come off that free agency board, I'm like, hey, I'm getting a little antsy over here. Like, do something. Um, what I didn't also realize, though, is they still have the other tackle from the Steelers on the roster, which, again, I don't trust him for as far as I can throw him. And I can't throw his big 300 pound ass anywhere. So I don't trust him at all to be the swing tackle on this team. As a matter of fact, I think they have him listed. Yeah, as the backup tackle um, at right tackle. But I, I, again, it doesn't matter. I still uh, firmly believe that we needed a guy and they brought Cornelius Lucas back and I couldn't be more elated by that. He was, he's been nothing but good. And eventually he's not going to be good anymore. Right. At some point, I just hope we don't get to see it. I don't want to tarnish the legacy that Cole Luke has created here. He's, he's wandered into Ty and Seki um, status, right. Into Ty and Seki land. Uh, with the way he's played. Remember, Inseki was like 80 years old when he was here backing up Trent. And we always felt good about Ty Inseki. And then even after, when he turned 81, he went to the Bills and played another two or three years. Inseki was one of those rare guys that um, outkicked his coverage in terms of how many years he ended up playing. He was a late bloomer, though. He, he didn't get into the league until um, I think he was in well into his 30s. So uh, he had to make up for lost time playing, I think, in other leagues, trying to get his way into the NFL, finally got his shot, and uh, he made the most of it when, you know, while he could. But Cornelius Lucas feels sort of Ty and Seki-ish in that regard where, you know, he's 33 now. I still feel good about him and better than most other teams probably feel about their swing tackles. And um, I'd like to keep it that way. I hope he continues to play well. I hope we don't have to see him on the field, to be honest with you. But should he have to play, he's done nothing but instill confidence in me. Uh, can't speak for any of you. He's done nothing but instill confidence in me that he's more than serviceable and able to get the job done, right? So there's that. But in any event, um, let's get to some fun, right? I, I got this fun activity for us tonight. So I've got my handy dandy pad. I've got a writing utensil, and we're going to have some fun tonight. So after the free agency dust has settled and smoke has cleared, and I think the Cornelius Lucas signing kind of marks that for me. Now, again, I could see one or two more marginal signings happening that are really not all that important in the grand scheme of things. Um, but for the most part, we're done with all of the, the important matters of free agency so with that said now we can recalibrate look at what needs now exist and then start to put them in the order of importance as we head towards late april in the 2024 nfl draft i think the best way to actually do that because it's so easy to forget about players it's so easy to think about it in your head but seeing it is I, i'm a visual learner okay you can tell me things and I can pick it up, but I'm much stronger when I see it. I'm a visual learner. So I thought, what a fun activity it would be if we did this together. Instead of me doing it by myself, we could do this together. So here's what I came up with. I figured we could go ahead and we could look at the depth chart. And we can put names where we feel like they should go. And if there's no player to be put there, we'll leave it blank and we'll consider it a need, right? So we'll fill out these depth charts the best that we can, okay? And once we're done, we'll see what needs exist. We'll put them down on our list and then we'll move on to the next 
positional group or the next side of the ball. So we're going to start with the offense, then we'll matriculate our way to the defense, and then we'll go to special teams, right? We'll fill in all the gaps, we'll fill in all the names, and then once we're done, we'll be able to decide, do we need one of these or don't we need one of these? And And then we'll go back after we're done, after we compile our list of needs, and we'll figure out What's the most important? I think we kind of have a handle on what's going to be one and two on this list. But after that, I think it's anybody's guess as to what's important after the first two needs on the list, right? So this was the last depth chart that they put out. And this was, excuse me, heading into free agency. They put this depth chart out. As you can see, a lot of holes, right? So now we're going to fill these in the best that we can with the names that we think belong in uh, these spaces. And we're going to also put the, we're going to go as far back as the third string. I don't think we need to really go into the fourth string. Although there is one position that I think we need to add a fourth string uh, to. But uh, for the most part, I think third string is far back enough, right? So. With that said, let's get to the, and all you have to do is respond in the comment section, okay? And we'll fill this out together. So we'll start at the very top. Um, They have receiver set, and Terry McLaurin is first, obviously. Backing him up is De'Ami Brown. I don't think we need to do anything to that. What about you? Do you guys agree? Just put yes in the comment section or agree. Either one is fine. Uh, I think we can leave the first wide receiver position, the X, if you will, alone. I don't think we need to do anything to it. Um, Diami's backing up Terry. I don't think that's going to change. I think we're fine there. What what does you what do you guys say? If you're going to put no, then you need to give me a name to put there. You can't just say no and then like again. I don't know what you guys are thinking about when you look at this roster. Understand you're not going to fix every single need. Some of you don't understand this, the concept of you're not going to fix everything in one offseason. Deami Brown is not a problem, so you don't need to fix him. He may not be here next year when his contract is up, but for now, he fills a spot and a void on this roster as depth at receiver. So while you would want to move him away from backing up Terry McLaurin, I don't understand that. I'm I'm lost. Um, So I'm looking at the names. Um, Jahan is already starting, guys. Focus here. Focus, okay? The starters are already on the first line that they had starting. Now we're going to correct some of these, but Jahan's already a starter. So why would Jahan be behind Terry as a backup? Make it make sense. All right. So I think we're good here. I think most of you understand that um, Terry is here. Jahan uh, and Diami behind him is fine. Okay, let's matriculate our way down to the next position, left tackle. Do we have a left tackle on the roster? Yes or no? (laughs) Do we have a left tackle on the roster? Yes or no? Okay. I see a lot of no's. <laughs> no is correct. I, I think we can all agree there is no left tackle currently on this roster. We will leave this blank. I don't think we have a left tackle currently on the roster. Now, do we have a backup left tackle? Do we have a backup left tackle? Do we have a backup left tackle? If we have a backup left tackle, put yes and then put his name in the comment section next to your yes. Okay, I'm seeing it come in. 
Yes, Cole Luke. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Cornelius Lucas um, is, in fact, our backup left tackle. So we will slide him in right here as the backup left tackle. You guys are on it. He's the swing. He is, to me, the backup left tackle. Technically, um, he could be backing up both left and right, but we'll leave Trenton Scott there for the time being. We won't we won't mess with him. We'll leave him as the backup right tackle for now, right? No reason to touch that if they decide to attack it. We need two tackles right now, I think, is the consensus. So we'll leave that alone for now. We'll get there in a second anyway, right? Good job, guys and gals. Um, so now we move on to left guard. And currently starting is Chris Paul. Is, is that okay with you guys? <laughs> is that okay with you guys? Chris Paul starting at left guard. I'm going to put my vote in early. Hell no. That's not okay with me. I can't speak for any of you. Do you have a name that you think should go here? I do. I don't know about you. I'll let you guys tell me. And if I agree with you, we can go with that. Do you have a name? <laughs> Somebody put Nick Spaghetti. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a charge that <laughs> to the autocorrect. <laughs> Nick Spaghetti. <laughs> Allegretti, I agree with you guys wholeheartedly. Once again, Nick Allegretti, to me, is the, um, for now, he's going to get a chance to compete left guard. So we're going to slide Mr. Allegretti here uh, at left guard and um, make him the starter, right? Do we have a backup left guard? Do we have a backup left guard that we would like to throw into the mix? Any names? Chris Paul was starting there. If you want to slide him back one, I'm down with that. What says you? What says you? Okay. I'm seeing a lot of Chris Pauls. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. I say we do it. I second that motion. So we got Chris Paul here as our backup left guard. Okay. Loving it. Loving it. I like the way this is going. Center. Do we have a center, guys? Is there a center on the roster right now? Yes or no? Is there a center on the roster? Who are we putting in there? Who are we penciling in as our starting center? Okay, Beatis. Okay, I see it. A lot of guys, people just put the dude from Dallas. Okay, I got you. Tyler Beatis, it is. Let's go ahead and make Tyler Beatis our starting center. All right, I'm with it. Do we got a backup center on the roster? We got a backup center. Do we have a backup center on the roster? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of Ricky Strongbergs. Okay, I'm with that. I'm with it. Let's get let's get uh Ricky Strongberg up here. Let's get him as our backup center. Okay. So we're gonna go to right guard now. Sam Cosme is Firmly entrenched as our starting right guard. Don't think we need to touch that. Think that's perfectly fine the way it is. Do we have a backup to Mr. Cosme at right guard? Backup to Sam Cosme at right guard. So we have options. I'll just throw out a few names. And you can tell me if any of these tickle your fancy. You could move Andrew Wiley into that backup right guard slot. You could 
Um, consider Mason Brooks, a guy that they brought back from last year. You've got Braden Daniels, who was a draft pick of this team in the fourth round last year. We still have third string as well. So uh, we're going to clean up the interior um, after you guys give me a backup right guard. I see video channel said move Cosme to right tackle. I don't think you need to touch him. I think he's a better right guard than he is a, a, a tackle. But I, that just because they signed Cornelius Lucas doesn't mean they're not considering moving Sam Cosme out to right tackle. Still consider that. I would not, I would not call that a dead issue yet. Braden the GOAT Daniels. <laughs> All right. I see a lot. I see more for Wiley being the backup right guard. So we're going to make Andrew Wiley the backup right guard. Now, do we have a third string left guard? Do we have a third string left guard? We can go back as far as the third string if you'd like. I see a lot of Mason Brooks. I see Goods Jones. Okay. I like I like the idea of putting Mason Brooks as the backup left guard. Could be right guard, could be left guard. We're going to throw him in at, le at left guard. How about backup right guard, third string right guard? I think I think this is where we could slide in Braden Daniels. I don't know about y'all, but I think we could slide in Braden Daniels. Just give him a spot somewhere, right? He might not even make this team, to be honest with you. But um, and, and they could see him as a tackle still. He could be backing up... Um, um, our right tackle, wh whomever that is, right? Um, so right tackle, we currently don't have one, right? Let's see. I got an idea for our right tackle because we really don't have one. Give me one second. I got an idea of what to do for right tackle. And we should be able to clean that up fairly easily if this idea works. But we got to get Andrew Wiley out of there. As we all know, he ain't starting no damn where. All right. Think I got it. All right. All right, let's throw this in here. And this should take care of any person that's taken up a spot that we don't have an actual person to take that spot. This should help us with that. So Andrew Wiley is now out of there. And now we don't have a right tackle, which we don't. So no right tackle.
and we'll leave Trent Scott there unless y'all want to put unless you want to put Braden Daniels there as the backup right tackle. What do you want to do? Do you want to keep Trent Scott there or Braden Daniels as the backup right tackle? I'm going to let y'all decide. What do you want to do? Okay. A lot of y'all are saying, nah, leave Trent Scott <laughs> right where he is. All right. Uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll stick Braden Daniels just for the sake of sticking him somewhere at backup right guard. That's where we'll leave him. Okay. That's where we'll throw him. He's another body. He's young. I don't see them getting rid of him. They're going to give him every opportunity to compete. And if he, if they feel like he can't cut it, then they'll cut him, period, end of discussion. So um, let's move on to tight end. Do we have a starting tight end? Do we have a starting tight end? Do we have a TE1? <laughs> Somebody put Clint Didier. <laughs> Ertz. Ertz. I see Ertz. Ertz. I think Ertz is going to be TE1. Uh, whether we draft a tight end or not, I know a lot of you uh, are coming up with this idea in your head of, of Zach Ertz somehow being TE2. I, I just don't see it. He'll be here this year. He'll be TE1. He'll be the new Logan uh, Thomas. And uh, he'll be the guy mentoring. Even if we draft a tight end, he'll be the guy drafting or uh, uh, mentoring that that draft pick. Are you guys comfortable with John Bates as TE2? I'm, I think with the situation being what it is now, I don't think you can move Bates personally. My question is, are you comfortable with Cole Turner at three or would you move him to fourth and slide in Amani Rogers at three? I think that's the real question. I don't think Bates is going anywhere. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of it's this is a tough one, but I see a lot of y'all saying that um Amani Rogers is unproven and you want to put him at fourth. I don't have an issue with that. So we will stick him at four. That was a close one. That's the closest one we've had thus far. Um a lot of y'all wanted to see him go third, but I think it will there were more of you that um, feel like he just hasn't done enough. And you're right. I mean, his rookie season was his first year playing tight end. And while we saw flashes, we didn't see a ton. And then he gets hurt in his second year. Um, so we'll see what happens. So tight end is all filled up now, but you could still argue that there it's a need there, right? The, the guy that's TE1 is 30, you know, three years old and, and he's on a one-year deal. So Do we have a wide receiver? Do we have a uh, a wide receiver two right now? Yes or no? Do we have a wide receiver two? Jahan Dotson is wide receiver three, folks. Don't get bent out of shape. Your first three receivers technically start, okay? So you don't have to go crazy. Jahan Dotson, you know I feel... Just as good about Jahan Dotson as anybody out there. So do we have a wide receiver two on the roster or not? All right. So we'll leave spot two open. Diami is backing up that position. That's fine by me. Crowder's backing him up. No issues there. We keep pressing on, okay? 
Jahan is at wide receiver three. We have no one backing him up at uh, wide receiver three. And then we have Mitchell Tinsley as the third there. So that's fine. All right. I think that's more than fine. All right. So now we go to quarterback. Is there a QB1 on the roster? Yes or no? <laughs> I didn't even have to ask that, right? <laughs> I'm just I'm just joshing. I'm just kidding. I know there's no QB1. Is there a QB2 on the roster? Is there a QB2 on the roster? Is there a QB2 on the roster? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, nope. Y'all behave yourselves, man. Uh, a lot of y'all said Marcus Mariota, you're correct. He's QB2 right now on this roster. So we'll put Marcus Mariota as our backup. We don't need to worry about third string quarterback. I mean, it could be Jake Fromm, but I don't even want him on my roster. So I'm not even allowing him to infiltrate this depth chart. Um, I still think there's a chance that we draft two quarterbacks this year. I'm, I'm not ruling it out or they get an undrafted guy that they really like. And he ends up being a third straight quarterback. We'll see, but I'd be shocked if they didn't try to find a backup to the starter right now, right? Like for next year is what I'm talking about. We have RB one and Brian Robinson jr. I think most would agree with that. Do we have RB2 on the roster right now? Do we have RB2? I see Austin Eckler popping up. Let's get him. Let's place him in there where he goes. He'll be RB2. It'll be RB2. And then we got C-Rod as RB3 right now, and that's fine. I think that's that's the way this is going to go. Um, I would not be shocked if they drafted a running back, but um, I don't think that's a, a need that's high on the list. And then you see fullback. We're not going to worry about fullback. I don't think we're going to carry a fullback. You never know. Uh, but it, it, last time I checked in, in the um, – in the um, – in Cliff Kingsbury's offense, there's no fullback. So, all right. So having a chance to analyze the offense, we're done with the offense. All right. Let's list all the needs. Don't worry about putting them in order right now. We'll come back and we'll do that. Let's talk about the needs that we have. So we're going to start with the blanks and then we'll come back and we'll go through each position and we'll talk about whether there needs to be an addition made to that um, position or not. We don't currently have a left or a right tackle, a starter. So clearly tackle, we put left tackle, right tackle. Um, and you could just put offensive tackle if you wanted to just group it. Um, we don't have wide receiver two. So we would put wide receiver on the list. And technically, when you look at it, Yami's backing up both wide receiver positions, and then you got Crowder after that. You could probably use two of them, to be honest with you, because Crowder's on a one-year deal, and Diami is on the last year of his rookie deal. But um, we'll just put down wide receiver for now. Obviously, quarterback is a need. Now let's go through each position individually. So do we need one or two receivers in your opinion? One or two?
I see a lot of twos. Mr. Ron B says we just need one. District 202 says we just need one. Everybody else is saying just uh, John Madrano says we need one, but everybody else is pretty much saying two. I think that's what's going to happen, Blake Woody. If they do go with another receiver, it'll be one early, one late, right? So I'll just put down wide receiver number two, and then I'll put times two. We can use another receiver. Um, we talked about tackle already. I think we're good. We don't worry. We have to worry about like the backup tackles. I think we're good there. I think it, the starting position is where we we don't need anything on the interior. I think we can agree on that, right? I mean, if they wanted to draft another interior offensive lineman, knock yourself out. But with Biotis on a three-year deal, with Ricky Stromberg going into the second year of a four-year rookie contract, Allegretti coming in on a three-year deal, Chris Paul backing him up with two years left on his rookie contract, Mason Brooks is on the second year of a four-year rookie contract, um, Wiley is, I think, a three-year deal, second year, uh, going into the second year of a three-year deal. Um, and Braden Daniels on the second year of a four-year rookie contract. And Cosme, if I'm not mistaken, is going into year three of a four-year contract. So, or is this, this is year three for him, right? He was drafted in 21. So 21, 22, 23. No, this is Cosme's fourth year in the league, actually. So this is his last year. We'll have to make a decision on whether we're going to pay him or not next season, which we'll have the money. We'll have the draft capital um, uh, or the cap space to do it if we so choose. If he plays well again, I think you have to keep Sam Cosme and pay him. I feel like we're we're good um, on the interior. Tight end. Do we need a tight end? Do we need a tight end? Do we need to draft a tight end? Yes or no? Do we need to draft a tight end? Emmanuel, Kyle L, a lot. Yep. Yeah. No, I see some no's. I see a lot more yeses. B right says no. Abdul says yes. Yeah, I see more yeses than no. I'll put tight end down. See a lot more yeses than no. Okay. Um, and then QB is already down. Do we need more than one QB? Or are you good with just taking one guy at the top of the draft and moving on from that position, having Mariota here on a one-year deal? So I'll put down a uh, second QB. Uh, I see some of y'all saying UDFA. Some of, a lot of you are saying yes, take another QB. So um, just put times two at the quarterback position. But um, And I think the running back room is fine. If they draft a running back, I wouldn't be opposed to it, a guy with some speed. But um, everybody on in the running back room is under contract for at least the next two seasons. So – I don't really think there's a, a need uh, per se. Brian Robinson's going into year three of his deal. Um, he's got a four-year rookie contract. Eckler signed a two-year deal. And Chris Rodriguez is going into year two of a four-year rookie contract. So um, could Rodriguez be replaced with a rookie running back? Sure he could. Absolutely. Um, anyway, yeah, that, that was the last one. I'm sorry. Uh, I tried to get all the last little bit of the, the tea out of there. I'm sorry. I won't take any more sips. It's over. It's gone. <laughs> um, all right. So that is the offense. I feel good with what we were able to, to accomplish there. Um, that tea was good as hell. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think we accomplished all that we needed to accomplish there. I feel good about what we just did. Now let's go ahead and move our way over to the defensive side of the football. All right. And let's take a look at what we have to do over here. 
So a lot of work that's already been done. So now we just got to figure out where all of these pieces go. Okay. Um, so let's start at the very top defensive end. As you can see, neither of the defensive end spots have been filled. Um, we'll start with our starting left defensive end. Who we put, who we plugging into that void there? We have a starting defensive end. Let me ask you that first. Do we have a starting defensive end? See Armstrong's name popping up. I see his name popping up a lot. And I agree with you guys. So we'll take Dorrance Armstrong and we will slot him in here as our starting um, our starting defensive end. I think that's a no-brainer. Three-year contract we signed him to. He's going to start for us. Do we have a starting defensive right end, a right defensive end? Do we have another starting defensive end on this roster? This is a this is a hell of a question here. Do we have another starting defensive end on this roster? If so, who? If so, who? <laughs> uh. Okay. I see a lot of no's. I see a lot of Cleveland Farrells. I see a few uh, Dante Fowler Juniors. I think I see more ferals than anything. So we're gonna we're gonna slide Cleveland Farrell in there for now. Uh look, we'll come back and we'll discuss, you know, whether we need something there or not. But I'll uh, you guys have placed him there. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put Cleveland Farrell in here at starting defensive end. All right, um, let's go back to the top, to left defensive end. Is Andre Jones Jr. your backup defensive end? <laughs> Is he your backup uh, left defensive end? Yes or no? Is Andre Jones Jr. your backup left defensive end? Okay, I see a, a lot of no's. I agree. No, he's not. Who is our backup left defensive end? And it doesn't really matter left or right. You can just pick a guy. Um, we Because we're going to fill up both of these uh, backup defensive end spots. All right, I see a lot of Fowlers, Dante Fowler Juniors. So we'll go ahead and um, insert him here. All right, we'll come back around and we'll clean up any loose ends. Um, we got Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen starting as your two defensive tackles, duh. Um, John Ridgeway the third backing up Deron Payne, no issues with that. I think we, we're all pretty much in agreement that that's fine, right? But F.A. Obata is backing up Jonathan Allen. No, we're not going for that. Who's backing up Jonathan Allen? Do we have a backup defensive tackle um, other than F.A. Obata? Yeah, uh, Ty, Ephraim, John, yeah, District 202, 
<laughs> Jefferson says, I <"I'm> night. <laughs> yeah, it's Big Phil, right? I know he hasn't done a damn thing yet. And a lot of you have probably forgotten about him. Out of sight, out of mind. I get it. But Big Phil is still on the roster. And Big Phil is still a capable body inside. He's going to be your other backup defensive tackle. So I feel good about that. Other backup defensive end. Are we leaving KJ Henry here? Are we leaving KJ Henry here? Or are we putting F.A. Obata here? Or are we putting someone else here? What are we doing at defensive end? I see more FAs than we do KJs. So FA is going to get the nod. F.A. is going to get, and I agree. I agree with you guys, by the way. I think F.A. is better than K.J. Henry. I know there's a lot of people that K.J. Henry, uh, I think, might have won over at the end of last year. He didn't do enough for me, personally. I got F.A. behind Cleveland Farrell right now. Now, just to um, to appease some of you, we can slide K.J. back here. No issues with that. KJ can be right here as the third defensive end behind Cleveland Farrell, F.A. Obata, and um, be your third defensive end there. No issues with that. All right. All right. So now we go to outside backer. Who we putting there? We got one of those. It's blank right now. We got one of those. That's an easy one. <laughs> That's an easy one. It's clearly our guy, Frankie Louvu. So we'll slide in Frank. And insert him there. Do we have a middle linebacker? Or is Jamin Davis good right where he is? Do we have a middle linebacker? <laughs> of course we do. We got us the El Capitan of the defense now in B Wags. Put him right over Jamin there. All right. Let's continue on. Corner, do we have a starting left corner? Do we have a starting left corner right now? Do we have a starting left corner? So Forbes is starting at right at right cornerback. Forbes is starting at right cornerback. We're going to leave him right there. Do we have a starting um Matter of fact, we're going to call this the nickel. This blank is the nickel, right? This is the nickel. So I apologize. This first blank right here is the nickel. And we're going to call where St. Juice is starting right corner and where Forbes is starting left corner. So do we have a nickel on the roster right now? See a lot of Quans. Do you, you, do you really want to put Quan at nickel? 
starting at nickel. I'll put him there. I see a lot of Quans. I see a lot of Quans. If you want to put him there, okay. Quan Martin it is. Quan Martin will be your starting nickel for now. We'll put him in there. Which means... We don't have a backup nickel. He can't be in two places at once. All right. Starting left corner. Emmanuel Forbes Jr. is our starting right corner. Starting left corner. Do we have one on the roster? All right, so I see a lot of Michael Davis. I agree. Um, he will be a Band-Aid solution for one year. Um, Forbes will be your starter on the opposite side. Do we have a starting strong safety? Str starting strong safety. Starting strong safety. All right. I see Jeremy Chen showing up as he should. A bunch. Let's get Jeremy Chen in there as the starting. Strong safety. Do we have, is Percy Butler your starting free safety? Is Percy Butler your starting free safety? If the answer is no, put who should be starting at free safety. <laughs> no, no, yeah, Percival is definitely not supposed to be starting on this defense. Um, I won't throw him in the garbage can like some of you will, but he's definitely not the starter. I, again, out of sight, out of mind, Derek Forrest is one of those guys we were really excited about last year, and a lot of you have recognized that, and you have placed him as the starting free safety, and I concur. I concur. So Derek Forrest is uh, your starting free safety. So now let's go back through and fill in some of these backup spots if we have the players on the roster to do so. Um, we took care of the defensive uh, line for the most part. Do we have a backup outside backer on, on the roster currently? Is there a backup outside linebacker? Yeah, you guys are on it. You're on it. Jamin Davis is definitely the backup, uh, and he'll see the field quite a bit, quite a bit. There'll be a lot of these sets where he'll probably be on the field with Frankie Louvu and Bobby Wagner at the same time. Just depends on what they decide to do. But, yeah, Jamin is going to be backing up Frankie Louvu here. Um, do we have a backup middle linebacker currently on the roster? I see a lot of no's. I also see a lot of Pittmans. They did sign Pittman, but 
I don't I don't know if he needs to be a backup middle linebacker. He might be a backup outside backer. I don't know. You want to put him there? I don't even remember what his position was when he was in college. Was he a middle backer? Was he an outside backer? I just know um, I think he's an outside backer, more likely than not. But they signed him and he got, hey, he got a press conference, right? If you get a press conference, then we got to throw you up here somewhere. So we'll throw Anthony Pittman up here. We'll put him back here and we'll say that we don't have another backup um, to Bobby Wagner, which is scary. Right? Nickel. This was a, a very debatable position. Clearly, Quan Martin was voted in as the nickel we don't have another nickel All right. so we don't have to um even think about that let's get into the cornerback position a little bit so we got our two starters right now and michael davis and emmanuel forbes jr um give me another name of a, of a, a corner who's who's backing up michael davis at the cornerback position <laughs> damn y'all trying to do my man's like that how dare y'all ju oh, jump over juice with uh noah igbenogany <laughs> y'all y'all trifling for that no i saw a lot of juices and uh that's the right answer right he wasn't good last year at all but um doesn't mean he won't be better in this scheme we'll see what happens but benjamin st juice is your backup um at that cornerback two, that CB2 spot right now. Um, speaking of which, who's backing up Emmanuel Forbes? Do we have a backup for him currently on the roster? I saw some wild goose action in there in the chat. <laughs> oh, no. Um, oh, man. I think y'all are realizing how dire straits the cornerback position is on this roster. Um he didn't even get a presser, so it's not a mandatory thing to throw him up here, but we'll throw Noah Igbenogany up here, and we'll put him here as the backup corner. This is bad, guys. This is really bad. This cornerback situation is pretty tough. and We'll leave Tariq Castro Fields as the third back there. Um, that's some nasty work at cornerback, just so we're clear. All right. Um, Strong safety. Do we have a backup strong safety? Do we have a backup strong safety? Currently on the roster. <laughs> All pro Revo. You guys are on it. All pro Revo will be placed here. Do we have a backup free safety? Do we have a backup free safety? Percival Butler, it is. Percival Butler, it is. All right. So 
that right there, my friends, is the defense. All right. That's what the defense looks like. All right. Percival Butler rounds out the defense. So now the question is, we got to go back through and see what it is exactly we need. So do we need a, we don't have any. So the, this is the good thing on defense. Unlike the offense, there aren't any blanks here. Now you could argue, you could argue that there's a blank at nickel corner, right? At, at nickel back. You could argue that there's a blank there, but we filled it in with Quan Martin for now, which I'm okay with. Um, but I still think you need to address that. We'll talk about that here in a second. So there are no blanks. So we're going to go through this thing position by position because there are no blanks, no clear glaring holes like there is on the offensive side. Defensive end. Do we need any defensive ends? Yes or no? We got like 19 of them, but of the 19, 17 of them are on one-year deals. Do we need any defensive ends? All right. Yes. And I'm going to put down in my notes one starter because I don't think any of us are comfortable with Cleveland Farrell starting at defensive end. Now, if he has to, he has to. Right? I'm not tripping about it because he can set a physical edge, stop the run. But again, you're not content. You shouldn't be content with him. But again, if if we got a role with Cleveland Farrell for one year as a starting defensive end until we can get another guy out there, again, you're not going to fix everything till you're liking in year one. So be it. Uh, you can do a hell of a lot worse than Cleveland Farrell. That's for sure. So um, we're good at defensive tackle. We're, we, we, got, we need a defensive end. I think we feel good about outside backer. Do we need a middle backer, though? another middle backer and keep in mind, Jamin Davis is on. If they don't pick up the fifth year option, which I'm pretty sure they're not going to pick up the fifth year option at this point. If they don't pick up the fifth year option, Jamin is going into his last year and Bobby Wagner is on a one year deal. So do we need a backer? I'll just put linebacker down. And then in parentheses, I'll just put linebacker down. Really, it doesn't matter. We need both, you could argue. Middle backer and outside backer, but we really need both. Um, all right, so moving right along to nickel corner. I, I'm just going to write it down. I'm not going to ask. We need a nickel. Do we need corner back help? Yes or no? <laughs> Yes or no? <laughs> Do we need a quarter or two or three? <laughs> Do we need a quarter? How many corners do we need is the question. I don't even think the question is, do we need cornerback help? Move nickel aside. That's its own position. Boundary corner, how many do we need? How many boundary corners do we need? <laughs> Emmanuel said four. <laughs> two. I think two is a good number. I think two is a good number. I see a lot of twos. I think two is a good number. But Ralph says 1,100. <laughs> Y'all are stupid. <laughs> All right. I, I think I feel good about safety right now, especially when you consider Quan Martin is still considered a part of the safety group. Um, when you look at the years, though, Jeremy Chin is on a one-year deal. Now, if he balls out, he could be right back here next year. He's still relatively young. He could be right back here next year on a three-year deal, right? Jeremy Reeves signed a two-year contract, so here's, he's under contract for the next two seasons. Derek Forrest, if I'm not mistaken, is going into the last year of his deal, though. And Percival Butler is going into year three of a four-year rookie contract. So um, Reeves has two years left. 
Forrest is on the last year. Percival is uh, has two years left. Chin is on the last year. Okay. So do we need any safety help in your estimation? Yes or no? Quan Martin is going into year two of a four-year rookie deal. So three years left for Quan Martin. Chin is on a one-year deal. Reeves is on a two-year deal. Um, Forrest last year. Percival Butler, two years left. All right, so I see no need, want, yes. I'll write it down, but when we rank it, we can just rank it way further down the list, right? I, I think that makes a ton of sense because while it's a need, I don't think it's a big need. And like I saw some of you say already, we have other pressing needs. This one is kind of far down the list, but I'll write it down anyway. So. That takes care of the defensive side of the football. Now let's move on to special teams. See what is needed there. All right. Special teams. So as you can see, <laughs> Tress Way is our punter. There are no backups here uh, with the punter, the kicker, the holder, the long snapper. There are no backups, right? Just kick off. Punt returners have backups. So Tress is your punter. Tress is your holder. There's nothing to discuss there. Do we have a kicker on the roster? Do we have a kicker? <laughs> John Hall. I actually got his autograph. <laughs> it's Brandon McManus. It's Brandon McManus. All right. Do we have a long snapper on the roster? Do we have a long snapper? And yes, uh, Cameron Cheeseman has been brought back. So we do have two long snappers. On. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Cam Cheeseman is not on the roster. <laughs> All right. They signed Tyler Ott. So we'll insert him. <laughs> I think I got some of y'all with that. <laughs> All right. Kick returner. Do we have a kickoff return man on the roster right now? Do we have a long snap? <laughs> yeah. I got I got some of y'all. I see that. I got some of y'all. Yeah, Kaz Allen is still currently on the roster. They brought him back. They brought him back. He will be invited to camp as of right now. So we can leave this blank or we can make it Kaz Allen. What, what do y'all want to do? I'm, I'm leaving this up to y'all. We can leave it blank or we can insert Kaz Allen. Remember, they're changing. They're going to probably vote to change the kickoff rule. 
So this is a big position again. All right, I'm going to leave it blank. I see more blanks than anything else. I'm going to leave it blank. I'm going to leave it blank. All right. So, obviously, you look at this. I can't, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. I don't expect them to do anything at kicker, although uh, they could bring in some camp uh, competition. Highly unlikely. They're not spending any draft capital on it. I can tell you that. Uh, would, will they bring in an undrafted guy? I could see that. That's not out of the realm of possibility. Remember, McManus only signed a one-year deal. It's not like they signed him to a three-year deal, which would mean he'd be here for the foreseeable future. Um, he's on a one-year deal. He could be replaced. So uh, I don't see any needs here other than kick returner. So we'll write down kick returner. Um, Jamison Crowder is your punt returner. They got Jahan Dotson backing him up, but um, you probably could upgrade over Jamison Crowder, to be honest with you. I mean, who are we kidding? We probably could use both of them. But again, that's a, a need that's down the list. As long as Crowder does what he did last year, just doesn't fumble. That's all I care about. Um, I'm, I got PTSD. So just don't fumble the ball. And if you give us a return every so often, great. Just don't fumble and and don't have stupid penalties. Don't have blocks in the back and all that dumb shit we would do to, to destroy any field position that we would get. But uh, I digress. So, um, all right. That was fun. I knew that um, you guys would enjoy that. I enjoyed that thoroughly. You guys are hilarious, by the way. So now let's get to the business of putting these needs in order now, okay? So quarterback is at the top of the list. I'm not even leaving that up to debate. So QB will be first on the list. What is second? And I'll go through all the needs, and you guys can tell me what is the next biggest need. So QB is first. Don't have anything without that. They're going to take care of that with the second overall pick. These are the needs on the needs list after going through all of the positions. Tackle, wide receiver, quarterback, tight end, defensive end, linebacker, nickel, corner, safety, kick returner. What's the second biggest need on the roster? What is the second biggest need? All right, I see tackle, and I agree. That's the second biggest need. What's the third biggest need on this team? So QB is one, tackle is two. Here are your remaining needs. Which one is the third biggest need left on this team? Wide receiver, tight end, defensive end, linebacker, nickel, corner, safety, kick returner. What's the next biggest need? What's the third biggest need? All right, so I see a tie between corner and edge rusher. So 
we got our first four needs. Quarterback is one, tackle is two, corner and defensive end are tied for third. So those two are third and fourth, whichever order you want to put them in. Um, what's the next biggest need after corner and defensive end? These are the ones that are left. Wide receiver, tight end, nickel, linebacker, safety, kick returner. Wide receiver has it for the next biggest need. So we'll put that at fifth right now. So what's the next biggest need? We'll do two more. We'll go to seven. One, two, three, four, five. We'll go to seven needs. We'll put them in and then we'll we'll have our seven biggest needs. Because um, I think you're going to double up on multiple positions in this draft including tackle. So you're not going to hit because you we have nine picks in this draft. You're not going to get nine different positions. You may get seven different positions. You may get six different positions, right? So what's remaining is now tight end, linebacker, nickel, safety, kick returner. All right. I'm going to go with uh, tight end here. Now we got one more spot left. And it's between linebacker, nickel, safety, and kick returner. I separated nickel and corner because one of them is boundary. The other is in the slot. If we draft a nickel and don't draft any boundary corners, that's not the same thing. Cause a nickel usually can't go outside and play. Like we, we did this. We've done this before with Danny Johnson, right? Um, Danny probably was even better outside than he was inside, but um, you, generally your nickel is inside. So while a nickel could go out there and play, like if you draft Mikey Sandristrill, he's not going outside to play boundary corner. He's a nickel. More of a safety, if you ask me, but he can play nickel. I actually want a true nickel corner, and there are a lot of them in this draft. So we'll make nickel seventh. So these are the needs that you guys have picked. And this is the order in which you've put them. We need a quarterback. We said that we need two of them, 
whether they get one obviously at number two and then double back and get another one later debatable undrafted guy i've seen joe milton's name pop up a bunch of times you know they'll have options towards the back end of the draft as to what they want to do okay um or undrafted like a guy like joe milton probably he might not get drafted joe milton probably won't get drafted you know and if he doesn't he could end up here as a camp arm and end up making a roster or, you know, worst case scenario, being on the practice squad. So if he goes undrafted, he's probably on the practice squad and nobody will touch him. But quarterbacks first. Tackle is second. We we went through the list of needs. We need both a left and a right tackle. We do not have a starting tackle on this roster as of right now. Cornelius Lucas is a swing tackle. He's one of the better swing tackles. You feel good about him at swing tackle. You do not want him starting. We don't have a starting tackle. So that is the second biggest need, right? You guys said that the third biggest need was tied in terms of a starter at defensive end, which I could see them rolling with what we have. They put a Band-Aid solution on defensive end for now, and they'll come back next year and attack defensive end aggressively. Like Dorrance Armstrong is your one starter. They they put a bunch of Band-Aid solutions with the rest of the guys that they brought back on one-year deals, and they're just going to roll with that. I could see that being the case because, again, you can't fix everything in one year. So instead of wasting a, a perfectly good year of service on a guy that may not play a ton at defensive end because you have all of these defensive ends that you've signed that are in front of him, why not – Wait until all of these guys are no longer on the roster, draft a rookie, allow him to come in and play next year. Um, but you have defensive end tied with corner. Boy, the secondary looked rough, okay? Um, we need a nickel. If you don't consider Quan Martin, we had Quan starting at nickel. Maybe they see Quan as a nickel as well. Um, but we need a nickel unless they consider Quan Martin a nickel. And if, if that's the case, then we don't need a nickel, right? But the cornerback, I'm more concerned with corner, right? I'm more concerned with corner, outside boundary corner right now. We put down, we need two of them. You have Mike da Michael Davis starting opposite of Emmanuel Forbes Jr. <clears throat> you should not be comfortable with that setup as is. We don't know what Emmanuel Forbes Jr. is going to be. I still think the kid can play, and I haven't given up on him, and I still think he's got a bright future. Michael Davis is a stopgap. I think he can play well in this system, but you should not feel like he's the answer, end-all, be-all. He's almost 30 years old. He's on a one-year deal. Understand what he provides us with. Again, I've stated this multiple occasions. I think he's Ronald Darby from 2020. Ronald Darby was excellent in that season, but he was also gone the next year. So you probably need, and and uh, and keep in mind, Benjamin St. Juice is your backup. The only backup that you have on the roster right now, unless you want to include Noah Igbenogany. So I'm going to move corner up to three by itself, okay? And then we'll put defensive in at four, okay? So you guys have wide receiver two at fifth, okay? We need a wide receiver two. Right now, you have Jahan starting in the, in the slot as a nickel. You have Terry starting as your X. You need a Z receiver. I would probably move that ahead of defensive end, to be honest with you. What, what says you? Is wide receiver two a greater need than uh, starting a uh, defensive end? Let me know. Wide receiver two ahead of defensive end or not? If you say no, we'll leave it the way we have it. If you say yes, then we'll move wide receiver two up to fourth biggest need.
All right, I see more yeses. So we'll move receiver up to fourth. Edge rusher down to fifth. And I see a lot of what you're saying. It just depends on how the board falls. I agree with that. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Definitely depends on how the board falls. Um, but this is a deep wide receiver draft class. So you're going to get a receiver at some point regardless. But I hate when people use that as, a, as an excuse to not draft a position and then mess around and not get anything of note, right? That's what you don't want to do is, oh, yeah, no, there's plenty of them. And then you look up and all the good ones are gone and you're getting just a basic as Quez Watkins type wide receiver or uh, Antonio Gandy Golden type receiver. No disrespect. No disrespect at all, but we've been down that road before. All right. We got tight end at six. And we got nickel at seven. We left out linebacker, safety, and kick returner. I guess we all kind of feel like those positions, you don't have to get. Those are luxuries at this point. You get one. I kind of feel like that's what defensive end is at this point. It's a luxury where you would like to add one, but it's not really necessary at this point. You have other pressing needs that might be um, of more importance. I think safety is not something that you have to worry about right now. I don't think you have to worry about kick returner. You're not drafting an individual player to be your kick returner. If you draft a receiver who just happens to be a kick returner in college and, and can return punts and kickoffs and things of that nature, great. But that's you're not drafting a guy specifically off the strength of his ability to be able to return kicks. Even though, even though the rule changed this year, if they do in fact change the rule and the, the proposal was sent in today, right? There was a proposal made to change the rules to the XFL rules from 2020 and 2023. So if they vote on that and they decide to change those rules, it's going to increase the amount of kickoff returns in the NFL. So having a kick return, man, does become more important at that point. All right, so here we are. I, I, the, the, the results are in. This is what we have. Okay. Qu quarterback is your biggest need, followed by tackle, which then is followed by cornerback is your third biggest need. Wide receiver two is your fourth biggest need. Defensive end is your fifth biggest need. Tight end is your sixth biggest need. Nickel is your seventh biggest need according to the comment section according to the comment section all right so we got that settled appreciate all of your participation that was a ton of fun i enjoyed that exercise thoroughly i figured you guys would hope you enjoyed that that was a lot of fun so um Let's get to the comment section, see how you guys feel. Um, NGA, stand up. You are the newest member of the MOBB. Uh, Mob, you know what to do. Show NGA some love. Welcome him with open arms. Show him what it's like to be a member of the mob. NGA, welcome to the squad. Greatly appreciate you. Rob, you. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Rob U writes, Sup, Lou. Sup, Rob U. What's the likelihood of Cosme and Wiley swapping spots and co loop man in the left tackle spot until drafted rookie is ready? I mean, you know what? I wouldn't rule any of that out. Again, don't dismiss Cosme being kicked back out to tackle. I think it's a foregone conclusion that if Andrew Wiley remains on this roster, he'll be backing up one of the, the guard spots, right? <clears throat> Whether it's left or right, uh, probably goes back to his Chiefs days and where he was most comfortable at. But um, Andrew Wiley is not a tackle. 
He's not a starting tackle in the NFL, if you ask him. He's, he's more of a guard. And they could decide that Cosme should go back out to tackle, right? I personally do not like fixing things that are not broken. Cosme was excellent. Not good. Excellent at guard last season. Leave him be. And furthermore, he did something at guard last year that he seemed to not be able to do while it tackled the previous two seasons. Stay healthy. So I'm just going to leave him there and assume that we need two tackles. Now, could they see Cornelius Lucas as a Band-Aid solution at left or right tackle? And, and based off of what you know they get in the draft, they decide to um, put him at left or right based off of what they get. If they get a, a guy that played primarily right tackle in college, they're going to leave him at right side and, and put Cornelius Lucas at left tackle. If they get a left tackle, they can kick Co-Loop to right tackle. Sure, I can see that happening as well. But it, I'm not going into the draft thinking that way. I'm going into the draft assuming that two tackles are on the menu and Chef P is going to go and get us the ingredients we need to cook up uh, this fantastic meal of an offense. And the way to do that is to go to the store and get us two tackles. That's the way I envision this draft going is we come away with two starting tackles. Maybe one's not ready. And that's what the OTAs and training camp and the preseason are for is to figure out is this guy not uh, is this guy ready or not right they found out very quickly that Braden Daniels was not ready and I don't know why they thought he was ready the guy was 297 pounds coming out of Utah and none of his tape showed that of a guy that was going to be ready to go as a rookie but that's nor here nor there um, Braden Daniels could be ready to go at tackle all of a sudden who knows we are discounting him because he looked so awful last year but a year gaining weight, getting stronger, comes back out, looks totally different. This scheme may fit him better. Who's to say what Braden Daniels looks like? Right now, on the menu for me are two tackles. Whether those two tackles are ready to start, it's rare in this league that you have two rookie tackles starting. Seattle did it beautifully two years ago. It's rare, though. It does not happen very often. Teams are usually not comfortable starting rookies. And then you throw in a rookie quarterback into that mix. I find it highly unlikely that we start two rookie tackles. My guess is the starting one of the starting tackles is already on the roster. Or some team is going to cut a tackle after this tackle-rich draft is done and over with and teams select tackles. Someone's going to cut a veteran loose. And just like Charles Leno with three, four years ago, and we pounced and got ourselves a starting left tackle uh, that we have utilized the last three seasons or so. I believe that's something that else that needs to be considered. But uh, right now I see two tackles being selected. So um, I don't think Cosme's getting kicked out to, go to tackle, but while he is being kicked inside the guard, that's my guess. That would be my guess. Super DB Goat. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Super DB Goat. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, I was leaning towards Daniels, but I'm honestly cool with either one now. I'm just trusting the process and hoping they put the QB in the best position. And honestly, that's the way you should go about this. Now, What ultimately happens is anybody's guess. What should happen is, again, anybody's guess. This is the thing, and I knew this was going to happen. Everybody's all over the place. Everybody's all over the map with this, what should Washington do with number two? You could talk to 20 people, and you'll get 20 different answers. 10 of them might say May, 10 of them might say Daniels, but um, hell, you wouldn't even get that breakdown. 10 would say, you know, May, uh, or seven might say May, seven might say Daniels, and six might say J.J. McCarthy. Who knows? I mean, this shit is crazy. People are all over the map, all over the place. But let's just say you get 10 say May, 10 say Daniels. Then you're going to get people telling you, but 
There's a but. There's never just, yeah, just take Jaden Daniels or just take Drake May. There's a but. But this guy's going to need this. This guy's going to need that, this, that, and the third. It's never just, hey, yeah, just take this guy, right? People are all over the place. And we knew this was going to happen, which is why I'm not really into that whole discussion of which over which. I've already stated my case for Drake May, but Jaden Daniels, Drake May, at this point, I could care less. Pick one, whichever one they think is best. I'm just going to trust their judgment, right? And if they think that Jaden Daniels is a better fit for what Cliff Kingsbury wants to do and the vision that they have for this offense, so be it. If they think Drake, uh, Drake, uh, uh, Drake May is that answer, absolutely go for it. Um, and we just roll, right? Whatever they decide, I'm, I'm other than any, you know, other than JJ McCarthy, I'm not okay with that. And I'm not okay with just being okay because JJ McCarthy is just okay. And as I've said, I've said this already, he may turn out to be the best quarterback of this group that we're looking at, of these, you know, second, you know, the the, the second overall pick options of May. Daniels, um, McCarthy could be the best of the three when, when it's all said and done in terms of an NFL career. That doesn't mean he's going to win anything. Doesn't mean he's going to win anything. Just means he was better. The other two just didn't pan out. But my money's on these other two being better than J.J. McCarthy. So um, I'm just going to enjoy the ride too. And I think you should as well. I agree, Super DB GOAT. Keith, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Keith writes, love everybody in here, man. I've been sitting back watching Chef P cook, and it looked like we're going to Sizzlers. We're going to Sizzlers. We're going to Sizzlers. We're going to Sizzlers. <laughs> LOL. I'm going to miss saying nasty work. Um, we definitely going to Sizzlers, bro. Um, this man is... He's over here getting busy on the grill, right? I told you there's a fragrance and aroma coming from the kitchen that we haven't smelt here in quite some time. But that's free agency aroma and fragrance. I'm trying to get some of that. Mm, that smell like draft. I, I need one of those, right? I need one of them. Give me one of them. Give me two of them. Oh, 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 oh. Let me get one of those. So. We'll see if he continues to cook up the way he's cooking up right now come draft time. I have no doubts. John Perez, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, JP writes. Good to see you as always, Lou. Likewise, JP. Um, there's an episode of the John Kahn podcast that includes an interview with Herm Edwards, who coached Daniels at ASU. It's a good listen. Really think he's our guy at number two. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to that. I've, I've had at least five people um, recommend that podcast. And obviously, Herm Edwards is a fan of Jaden Daniels, and um, he's going to have nothing but good things to say about him. And uh, But I still want to hear it. I still want to hear what he has to say. Um, Nothing that Jaden Daniels has done makes me feel like his character is something that should be in question. Um, I know a lot of people got on him about not staying at the combine. I don't know why he didn't stay, but that I don't really care about that. That's not that's I, that's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. People like to nitpick at just about anything they can get their hands on. Um, at the end of the day, is he a good dude? Is he a leader? Is he knowledgeable about the game of football? And probably most of all, above all else, does he love it? Because he's talented enough. Does he love it? And, and those questions go for every prospect, specifically the quarterbacks, but every prospect that you're um, looking at. You know, the leadership thing, that's especially specific to the quarterback because whether you want to be or not, when you're a quarterback, you're a leader of the team, whether you want to be or not. So do you love ball? 
Are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to sacrifice? Not everybody's Tom Brady, I'm aware. Not everybody's willing to make life changes and sacrifices to win at the highest level. But are you willing to do what it takes to win? Are you willing to put in that extra time? And I ain't talking about just getting the fellas together over the summer in Florida for three days. Anybody can do that. We've seen quarterback. John Beck got the fellas together during the uh, lockout. Like, yeah, that, that, that doesn't move me. That's cool. I'm, I, I want you to do that. But clearly, I need more than that. I'm going to take a listen to it. Barry Gray Beats, thank you for being a member for six months. Appreciate you, who writes, uniform upgrade, needs stripes to, I'm assuming that's the pants. Um, I don't think you're going to get any uniform upgrades. I'd be surprised if anything was done from a uniform, a name, or anything standpoint. You, even throw a stadium in there. You know, they're going to try to upgrade the stadium because they know we're going to be here for a while. I mean, we still haven't figured out where the stadium is going to go. So you can't break ground on something where you don't even know where you're breaking ground at. So the longer that that takes, the longer it's going to take for us to get a brand new stadium. These things take time. You know, these things take time. So um, a, a uniform tweak is, I, I think, a simple change that they could make. I say that, but I'm not the one spending all the money on these uniforms and this, that, and the third. They got other pressing issues to try to take care of. So I don't think they're going to really put too much thought into the uniforms right now. But if there was one thing I would say uh, with the unis is I was perfectly fine with the Washington football team look. They could just go back to the classic look. Like they didn't need to change that. But of course, when you're doing a full rebrand, you want everything brand new, including the uniforms. But if we're being honest, just go back to the look with the Washington across the front, right? Um, and, you know, if you want to keep the helmets the same, I'm cool with that. I don't have any issues if you want to keep the helmets, you know, the same. I think with those uniforms, though, you don't probably don't want a matte look on the helmets. You want a shiny helmet. But um, if they wanted to keep the helmets the same, fine. But I don't think they're changing anything. So anyway, I digress. Barry Gray Beats, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for uh, being a member of the MOBB who writes, what's up, Lou? What's up, Barry? Hope you and, and yours are well. Absolutely. Likewise. Likewise. Could there be a uniform upgrade this year? Is year three. They said it could be after two years. We need stripes. I don't know. I remember Jason Wright saying that they were going to introduce another uniform in year three um and they were going to have the fans vote on it remember he said that but i don't know it, that was under the last regime and and they may have redirected their uh attention and their focus to other pressing needs and if that's the case nobody's going to hold them to that statement that they made under dan snyder nobody cares right we'll see what they decide to do my guess is we haven't heard anything about a uniform upgrade and that we're not going to because they're worried about getting look we could sit here and nitpick about the uniform and we could you know talk about the name and this that and the third i guarantee you if they win on the field those grumblings will get quieter and quieter they're not going to totally go away there, there are people who can't stand the name commanders and won't let that go until it changes and that's fine OK, I got no issues or gripes with people who can't stand the name and want it changed. But I can tell you that group of people, the noise that they're making and the barking that's being done, it shrinks. If the team is winning on the field, it's easy to make noise and be upset and belligerent. When you're losing because everybody's mad. You start winning and some of that stuff goes away or at least quiets a bit. So winning is the most important thing. 
And that's why they're focusing their attention on that and the stadium upgrades to Commander's Field. Now, got to get used to saying that. No longer FedEx. Now, maybe the name change of the stadium is what we need to actually make it feel like a home field advantage again. Because clearly FedEx was never a home field advantage. Or at least it didn't feel like one. Christopher McLaughlin, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Chris, thank you. Writes, hey, Lou, what's up, Chris? Hope all is well with you and the family. Likewise, as always, hope everything is all good in your neck of the woods. Two questions. One, what are your thoughts on trading up twice into round one and giving up two third round picks to secure a left and a right tackle and why? Two, how do you think Kingsbury improves red zone efficiency this season? Well, for one, for starters, <clears throat> one thing that I noticed watching Cliff Kingsbury's offense, specifically in 2021 when they made the postseason, is that they ran the football in the red zone. And I've always said the best red zone offenses are the ones that can run the ball into the end zone. You want to know why the 49ers were so prolific? at scoring and why Christian McCaffrey was looked upon as the best you know, player on offense last year for a vast majority of the season and led the NFL in touchdowns is because when they got into the red zone, they were going to run the football. You want to know why the Detroit Lions are, are one of those prolific teams that score a lot of points and are efficient in the red because they run the football. Teams that run the ball in the red zone. I remember our first year with Scott Turner. Um, look, we didn't score a bunch of points, but we were very efficient in the red zone that year. And a huge part of the reason why is because we could run the ball in the red zone. Remember, Antonio Gibson had like 13 touchdowns in his rookie season. Now, he would never, ever come remotely close to that again. But he was fantastic in that rookie season. And between him and Peyton Barber, we were running that bitch into the end zone. And that's why when we got down there, we didn't get down there. That was the problem with that offense is we didn't get down there nearly enough. But when we did get down there, we were scoring because we could run the ball. And Cliff Kingsbury will run the football when he gets down into the red zone. So I do think that's going to help the offense in terms of efficiency in the red zone. But uh, having a guy like Austin Eckler also helps getting him the football. And hopefully – will have better play design. I've struggled with the play design in the red zone. I actually think there were a couple of times where Eric Benemy got really cute and drew up some really nice plays and used Sam's legs as a threat in the red zone. And we scored against Dallas on Thanksgiving in that way. And excuse me, we scored in another game where I think Sam used his legs and it was a design run. So uh, there were some times where I thought Benemy did some really nice things in the red zone. But for the most part, um, he never really got the ball to his playmakers in the red zone. And there, and then the scheme wasn't good enough. That was always Scott Turner's problem is his scheme down there was garbage. He didn't have actual plays that were designed to, you know, exploit certain coverages down in the red zone. And that's what the best play callers do is it's less about matchups, more about individual players. And if you get past that, and you need to find a way to scheme it up, then you need to be able to scheme it up and get a guy open. If you're getting man coverage, then you should be running rub routes and things of that nature uh, to get the ball to somebody wide open. But, but we just we don't do those things, right? Everything is so hard because we haven't had, I think, the right play callers. Cliff Kingsbury, I think, will take some of the stress off of the offense. But um, you, you asked about trading up twice into the round one. Um I don't know if they're going to trade up twice into the first round. You got to have two willing, you know, partners to do that. Two different teams willing to move out of the first round altogether. Um, I could see Washington trading back into the first round once and giving them a second first round pick. I don't know if that's what you meant, but um, I, I think that that's going to happen. I feel pretty confident that they're going to attempt at least to try to get back into the first round and get that starting tackle. Um, will it happen? I, who knows, right? If these tackles come off the board very quickly, 
you may not be in a position where the value is there for you to go back into the first round. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I think the guy to keep an eye on, this is the guy that I would keep an eye on, is Amarius Mims of Georgia because he he didn't play a ton in college. He doesn't have a bunch of starts. And then he gets injured at the combine. He's not working out at the pro day. And he's going to probably have to put together a private workout for teams. He could slip down draft boards based off of just the lack of production, the lack of tape, rather, and the lack of starts. He's extremely raw. And then the injury, so you can't really see him the way you want to. He gets healthy enough, and I assume he'll get healthy enough to you know put together an individual workout for teams prior to the uh, draft, which could make all of what I just said irrelevant. All, all, all it needs to be is one team saying, this is a big athletic son of a bitch, and we're going to take him because he's got everything we need, and we can coach up the rest. That's all it takes is just one team to say that. And he's exactly that. My hope is of the guys, because I don't expect the guys that I like to still be there. You know, I don't expect the Troy uh, Fatanus or the um, uh, Fuagas, you know, to be there. Um, JC Latham, I don't expect him to be there. Or Latham, I don't expect him to be there. Like, these are the guys that I like. I'm not as high on Amarius Mims because I like seeing, you know, what I'm getting, but I I know the potential is there. And he he could be the one that slips in the draft. He could be the one. Rocky D, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes... I know they will do a log documenting their picks, but it's interesting how they're going to spin the QB decision. Awkward to see QB controversy among the staff. Luckily, we are number two instead of number three. Yeah, you know, being two versus three is massive. You know, we were getting down to the end of the season and we were like splitting hairs. It came down to percentage points. And we barely beat out New England for two, right? And seeing where we are now makes a massive difference because we're going to find out, like, had we been third, we would have never known which one they liked more. And it could have gotten to the point where the one that they liked the most between the two, Drake, May, and Daniels, could have gone ahead of us at two, and it might have prompted them to then say, you know what, we could take J.J. McCarthy or trade back and then take J.J. McCarthy, whatever the case may be, right? A lot of things could have entered into the equation. When you're at two, we're going to know which one. Like, there's no secret. And this is what I love, because we can closely compare and contrast the two quarterbacks and watch their careers and say, you chose this one over that one, right? We don't have to guess which quarterback they like more they're going to tell us by their selection at two. They take Jaden Daniels. They like him more than Drake May. And then we can watch the two careers play out and figure out if we made the right decision or not. If they take Drake May over Jaden Daniels, we know they like Drake May more. And now we can play it, watch it play itself out and see if they got the right one. Now, the thing that gets a little tricky is we can say, oh, one is better than the other. but Fit is what is most important. And we've long said this. If Tom Brady goes to the Cleveland Browns, is he Tom Brady? Probably not. Probably not. Okay? Where you end up matters. It matters. I'm not telling you that Josh Rosen was going to be this all-world quarterback in the NFL. But him going to the Arizona Cardinals was the worst thing that could happen to him. They were a deadbeat franchise at that time. In transition, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. They hired a coach that they were going to fire, you know, after one season in Steve Wilkes. 
They didn't know if they were coming or going. That was a disastrous season, and he ended up in the worst situation possible. Okay? I'm not saying that if he had been drafted by the Bills or he'd been drafted by a different organization, he would have turned out to be good. But I damn sure, I know this for sure, he wasn't going to succeed in Arizona. Is Josh Allen Josh Allen if he goes to Arizona instead of the Bills? I don't know. He might not be. So that's also something that's important is the fit and the, the ecosystem that you create around your quarterback. I think that's important too. Um, I'm glad we're at two. We don't have to worry about just taking whoever falls to us. We get to decide which of the two we want. And that's a comforting feeling. Duncan Wright, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Duncan writes, I'm not here to support the team. I'm just here. <laughs> I saw that by your plumbing comments in the comment section as we were going through our needs. Okay. So I clearly, you're not here to support the team. You're here to create chaos, but you're here to support me. And I appreciate that. So uh, really do appreciate you, Duncan. <laughs> Pit Fight Entertainment. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes, betting on Amarni to meet his potential is 50-50. All things equal with BPA at tight end or DN. I would go uh, tight end on day two. Um, yeah, I, I, like I'm not factoring Amani Rogers into my decision at tight end. If if you like a tight end and he's there and you're really high on that guy, take him. Amani uh, Rogers doesn't factor into this at all. If Amani Rogers continues to develop and you feel good about him, um, great. He'll be a pleasant surprise as TE3, you know, on the roster. But as of right now, you can't you can't mortgage the future on Amani Rogers' upside. He's going into year three of being a tight end, right? Not just of his rookie contract. He's going into year three of being a tight end. And while he may be a, a restricted, you know, free agent and you can tender him and all of that stuff, if you want to hold on to him for an additional year, that's fine. But at the end of the day, he's still super raw. And he missed out on a full year of growing at a position that he's only been playing for two seasons. This will be his third. So. I'm not betting on anything with Amani Rogers. I'm not leaving anything to chance. If there's an opportunity to get yourself a real TE1, please, by all means, do it. Seriously, do it. Do it. I'm right there with you, Pit Fight Entertainment. John Madrano, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. John writes, to get back into the first, what team could we trade with? It's hard to say. You never know what team is actually willing to move out of the first round altogether. Um, Arizona does have two first round picks. All right. They got the first round pick from Houston and uh, from last year's draft when they traded back and allowed Houston to come up and get um, Will Anderson. So they've got the fourth pick already. And then they've got the 27th pick, I believe through the Arizona Cardinals. So they may be interested in moving out of the first round. Um, they could pick up two more first round picks and that would be insane if they do that because then they would have four first round picks if they move back with say the Vikings to 11 and then that would give them 11, 20, that would give them 11, 20, three, 11, 21, and 27. So they'd have three first round picks. Um, and then they'd probably get another first round pick next year. That'd be crazy. So Arizona could be a trade candidate, especially if they trade back with um, Minnesota. That 21st pick that the Vikings have, that could be the perfect spot to trade back into the first round to get your, your tackle. And then Arizona would still have 27th overall. And they would be getting 
compensation in this year's draft, maybe even next year's draft, depending on how they want to play it. They may say, nah, we got enough picks this year. We want your, we want your, uh, we want a second this year, obviously. You got two of them. We want one of those. And we want a second next year, right? That could be the case. Instead of taking a second and a third this year, they could look at it and say, no, 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 no. We got enough picks already. You know, I want something for next year. So we'll see. Um, Arizona seems like the most likely candidate right now, I would say, because they got the most draft capital and could potentially have more if they do do business with, the Minnesota Vikings at four pit fight entertainment. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes Adam P and company have earned my trust. Hope to go BPA and, and not try to chase too many needs. This year is not a super bowl or bust year. Let's focus on the plan for year one and then target year two or three. I couldn't agree with that more other than tackle. Is the only one where I say you have to get one early. Don't want to hear this nonsense about it's a deep draft at tackle. Get one early. And then if you want to double back because it's a deep draft and get one a little bit later, fine. Right. Um, everything else, I've already said this. My first two picks are non negotiable quarterback and tackle. After that, and again, I shouldn't say the second pick is non-negotiable because the, the picks are four picks apart. If you're not to trade into the, you know, back into the first round, you just stand pat at, at 36 and 40, um, they're four p- picks apart. So you could feel like the value there isn't at tackle. Hey, we can get tackle with the next pick at 40. But the value right now is at edge rusher or the value right now is at tight end, Right. And if that's how you feel, then strike while the iron's hot. Get the best player available there. And then you can double back, you know, at 40 and get the tight end uh, or the tackle rather. But one of those two picks needs to be a tackle. I'll just say that. Two out of your first three picks need to be spoken for at quarterback and tackle. After that, I'm like, BPA it, baby. You know, and if you go quarterback tackle, BPA it the rest of the draft. BPA it the rest of the draft. Because we should be in the business of getting the most talent that we can acquire and assemble onto this roster. To your point, we're not winning anything of note this year. A lot of people keep telling me, you can't say that. You don't know. I don't know what we're going to be this year. History says that with a rookie quarterback and a rebuilding franchise that has turned over the roster, you're the likelihood, and again, don't talk to me about Houston because Houston had already been, been building for three years. This is what people fail to realize when they mention Houston. Like Austin Eckler came in here. I was like, Austin, don't do that shit. Don't come in here steering, you know, stirring the pot, poking the bear and, and swinging at the, the, the um, hornet's nest and getting this fan base all riled up talking about it. I watched teams turn it around. I watched the Texans turn it around last year, and I'm like, that's cool, but you're forgetting one big part about that. They had already been building that thing, and all they did was when they got C.J. Stroud and they got D'Amico Ryans, they pressed the button. That was it. They had already been building for three years, new GM. They were swapping out coaches like we change underwear, but they had already been building towards that. And they put all the final pieces of the puzzle together with some of the moves made. Then you get some of the guys that have been there for a couple of years playing their best football, like Jonathan Grenard and, and guys stepping up, um, like the linebacker, Blake Cashman. And so, again, all those pieces were already there, right? They had already been building towards that. And you drafted a guy in the, uh, you know, at corner, second overall, and he stepped up and had a hell of a season in, in Derek Stingley Jr. All the pieces were there. Now you just needed to drop the quarterback in and, and have other guys step up. And that's what happened. And so that's not where we are. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just telling you, more likely than not, it won't happen. So I'm with you. Get best player available. After you get tackle and your quarterback, everything should be on the table at at that point. We need, because theoretically speaking, let's say 
you draft another tackle because we don't have a fourth round pick. Remember, right now as it stands, we got three thirds, two seconds, and a first. We don't have any fourth round picks. So whatever damage you're going to do, you need to do it in the first two days because after that, you don't draft again into the fifth round. You got two fifth round picks, and we know that's his round. That's his shit. That's his jam. Adam Peters is shit. His jam is the fifth round. We know that. But still, even with that said, you want to make sure that you take care of tackle, you take care of quarterback, and then whatever else you do, house money. If you want to double back and get another tackle with your last third round pick or your first fifth round pick, knock yourself out. You could theoretically say, yeah, we got a guy that we can start at tackle on the roster already. And then we drafted one early and now we got our two tackles. Again, don't rule out the you know premise of somebody shakes free after the draft. You see teams spend draft capital on tackles and then somebody's a cap casualty. Hey, let me cut this dude now. If he's on the roster, um, uh, you know, post June 1, he stands to make $5 million. We're going to cut him and make him and designate him as a post June one cut. And you might be able to jump on top of that. Excuse me. And, and, and make it happen and, and find a Charles Leno jr. And I'm not saying that's ideal, but a guy like that might come available and may be a better option than starting Cornelius Lucas. Not saying, just saying, right? So I still wonder would Cornelius or would Charles Leno Jr. have been cut if he wasn't having hip surgery? Would they have cut him anyway? I still wonder about that because we find out he's having hip surgery and immediately he's cut. Are the two things correlated or they were mutually exclusive? He just happened to be having hip surgery, but they were going to cut him anyway. I don't know the answer to that, but I wonder if he wasn't having hip surgery, would he have been back? Mr. Ron B, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. OG, triple OG, Mr. Ron B writes, AP and company have decided that uh, special teams needs to be impactful this season based on their free agency signings. Agree? Absolutely. Um, you should value special teams. It's a third of the game, right? It's a, th a third of what goes down in terms of the three phases. And so we didn't get enough from our special teams last year. You know, slide was a bit inconsistent. You could blame some of that on the, the snapping operation. But, you know, there were times where the snap and, and the hold were perfect and slide just missed, right? Obviously, Cheeseman was a liability, you know. And then – um I love Sly's kickoffs. They were all out of the back of the end zone for the most part. But we didn't get much out of our returns game on kickoffs in particular. Now, punts, Jamison Crowder came in, had one big punt return, but everything else was pretty much ho-hummish, right? But it was better than the year before. I can't sit here and complain about it because we were abysmal um, under Dax Milne uh, the previous two seasons. So um, it was good to get some sort of a spark out of the special teams department but um yeah they they've clearly said all right we're going to clean up the, the long snapping situation we're going to get us a kicker that we think is more consistent than joey slide and, and, and the issue i had with joey wasn't the the 50 plus yarders i was i got so blinded by his ability to make the big kicks from deep you know i, I always go back to that eagles victory in 2020 um too because it was such a big kick before the half that 56 yarder or whatever it was, was massive. And his ability to do that, Dustin Hopkins could never when he was here. It's, it's amazing. He goes to Cleveland and he's making like 59 yard field goals and like, like it's nothing. And I'm like, we always knew you could do that, but you could never do it here. And Sly came in and gave us what we were missing in that department. But then he wasn't as accurate from the money distance. And I've always said, the money distance is the money distance for a reason because you're going to kick most of your kicks from 40 to 49. And I know Brandon McManus made it a point of emphasis to point out 
Hey, I don't miss under 50, just so y'all know. <laughs> I'm money, bro. It's when it's over 50 and y'all got me out there kicking 63 and 60 and 58 yarders. That's when you might get a little something, you know, that's off a bit. But I'm, I'm going to hold him to his word. If, if you telling me, bro, don't you don't even got to think. Of, Joey Sly missed like a 33-yard field goal last year, like two of them. And then he did the – like he's so puzzled. Like how did that happen? I, I, I'll never forgive him for the Bears miss last year because I literally thought we were going to come back and win that game. He makes that field goal. We cut it to a one-score game. We are going to win that game. He never gave us a chance. So they're putting emphasis on special teams, which is why I wouldn't rule out them, you know, bringing in a guy, whether it's via, you know, your draft or uh, undrafted free agent like they did last year with Kaz Allen that could potentially uh, compete to try to make this roster as a return man. I wouldn't rule that out either. I would not rule that out. JB, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, Lou looks like offensive tackle and defensive end will be running at the same time. Hopefully Mims will be there. Uh, we'll see because I keep hearing the same theme that seven tackles could go in the first round. And I've always told you guys, Two positions get pushed up the draft board every year um, when the when the supply is there, quarterback and tackle. Now, the demand is always there for both positions, but with quarterback in particular, the supply isn't always there, like 2022. Um, both supply and demand are there for both positions. So you're going to see – I think you're going to see five quarterbacks go in the first round. I'm pretty confident at this point that five, I, I think five quarterbacks are going in the top 13 picks at this point. Cause I don't think Michael Penix Jr. gets past the Vegas Raiders at 13, to be honest with you. All right. So in that regard, you got five quarterbacks. You're going to have at least five to six tackles, possibly seven. You say there's going to be a run on defensive end. It could start as high as eight with Dallas Turner, thinking he's going to be the first one off the board. And then after that, you just see how they come off the board. Um, I know Latu. Latu's probably going to be a first-round pick. I don't know if Chop Robinson is going to be some, one of these edge rushers that everybody just assumes is going to be a first-round pick. I don't think he's going to make it. Jarrett Verse, Chop Robinson, one of these dudes ain't getting drafted in the first round, I think. Because right now – it's Dallas Turner, it's Jarrett Verse, it's Latu Latu, it's Chop Robinson, and it's the Robinson kid from um, Mizzou. Those are probably your top five edge rushers. It wouldn't shock me if one of those dudes didn't get drafted in the first round. It wouldn't shock me. So... We'll see if there's a run on edge rushers. Where the run is going to be is receiver. That's what you're going to see. You could see six receivers go in the first round. You already know three going for sure. I, I can't see an instance where the, the, the Brian Robinson kid from, um, I think his name is Brian Robinson. It's Brian something from LSU. Can't see an instance where he doesn't go in the first round. And I could see, you know, two or possibly three more receivers, you know, cleaning up at the back end of the first round. So um, it's it's going to be interesting to see. They're going to be – I'll say this. There will be a number of positions that don't hear them. Because there's an influx of so many positions that are going to hear their names called, I, I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to be at least four or five positions that don't hear their name called in the first round at all right like you won't hear a running back's name called in the first round you're not going to hear a tight end's name called in the first round you're probably not going to hear a um a linebacker's name called in the first round you may there may be one but i wouldn't be shocked to hear no first round linebackers um you're not going to hear a safety's name called in the first round 
Like there are a lot of positions that are going to be on the outside looking in because of how many tackles, how many receivers, how many quarterbacks all go in the first round. Edge rusher, you know, goes in the first round. So again, we'll see what happens. Um, It'll be interesting to say the least, but you got to hope that some teams, you know, decide on receiver and decide on edge rusher and defensive tackle. And that pushes some of these offensive linemen down, but that's usually not how it works. I do like that the Jets went out in free agency and got two tackles. We might be able to take them off the list of teams that will take a tackle in the first round. They traded for um, our old friend Momo, and they signed Tyron Smith. Here's the problem. Tyron Smith signed a one-year deal. They could decide, hey, let's go ahead and draft his replacement now. He may not play this year, but we're going to get a dude. I'm hoping that they go, nah, let's go get a a different position. And then I was, I said to myself, well, they're going to get a receiver now. Then they they sign Mike Williams to a one-year deal. I'm like, F that, man. Damn. So I don't know what the Jets are going to do. They could just take a tackle, right? But that's what you're hoping is that one or two of them fall down. And and if Washington is interested, they can get back in. If not, you just sit tight, right? Um, Pit Fight Entertainment. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, Double up. Uh, uh, Thank you for doubling up. Who writes, love this time of the year. Thanks for your efforts. Respect the passion, work, and research you put into your craft. Big things are ahead for you. I appreciate that. I really, truly do. This is a glorious time of the year because every team has hope. Nobody's, you know, four games under 500. No one's last place in the division. Everybody's got a chance, which is why our fans refuse to believe that this season won't yield, you know, 9, 10, 11 wins because they got hope. Everybody's got hope this time of the year. And I don't like smashing hope. I always tell you, I don't like being a dream killer. I'm not here to kill anybody's dreams. If you think this team can win 10, 11 games, go for it. Go for it. But the the, the sad truth of, uh, uh, of the matter is teams like Washington in the position that we're in generally don't. Generally don't. But every year, and this is the thing that you have to take into consideration, every year there are worst to first teams, teams that didn't make the playoffs the year before, that make it the the following year. Um, But we play in a really good division. And it's not going to be easy. It's easier to go worst to first when you play in the AFC South, like the Houston Texans did last year. Easier to do it that way, right? That's not the division we play in, so. Again, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I appreciate the um, kind words and, and the sentiments. And um, this is a fun time of the year. I will admit that. So uh, that's the last Super Chat. So we will get out of here. Um, March Madness is on the horizon. It starts tomorrow. So I don't know if you're going to see me or not. I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm not even going to try to perpetrate the fraud. You might not see me till next week. Um, I'm going to try to stay active. I'm going to try to, you know, keep some content coming out. But I go go into a trance when March Madness, the first weekend of March Madness. I go into a trance, man. I can't tell you why. I just do. It's awesome. It's fun to watch. And if the games are entertaining, I'm here for all of it. If they're not, then you may see me again. So um, we'll see what happens. But XL, the truth. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Who writes, who do you see as the other safety along with Chin? P.S. Ain't seen you at the Y lately. You ain't fell off, have you? Um, (laughs) So, the Y. No, I haven't fallen off completely. I haven't been going to the gym as much as I would like to. But um, I, I I I had a Planet Fitness and a Y membership. And I stopped going to the Y, um, and I just started going to Planet Fitness. So I'm still going to Planet Fitness, but I think I want my Y membership back. But the only reason I want my Y membership back is because I want the sauna. 
So I might be able to to have like a home sauna or something. So I'm looking into that because that's the only reason I would want a wide membership. That and I can bring my kids and and we can work out because they have, you know, uh, the child care. But Planet Fitness is so cheap and it's open 24 hours, which the Y is not. So there's a lot of benefits to Planet Fitness. But no, I haven't fallen off to answer your question. Um, but I hope you're still doing well, man. You told me you were going to give me a chance to box. I'm not, I didn't forget about that. I need that information, bro. I need that information. You said you got a gym around here. I'd love to come in and, and get some training in. Um, other safety, we got plenty of safeties on the roster. The safety position is loaded. Uh, we went through that already, that exercise already. I don't know if you just got here or not, but we went through the safety position. Ch Jeremy Chen was our starting um, strong safety. And we had um, Jeremy Reeves backing him up at strong safety. So we're good, right? Reeves backing him up at strong safety. You got um, Derek Forrest starting at free safety. You had uh, Percival Butler backing him up and. If they get a true nickel, you would have Quan Martin probably in that mix back there with, um, excuse me, in that mix back there with uh, Defoe. So we got we got a lot of uh, guys that we can shuffle around at that safety position. We got a lot of stuff back there, and uh, and and Jeremy Reeves is usually pretty solid. You know, when when he's forced into action, when he's pressed into action, he's usually pretty solid. You know, so NGA. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Once again, welcome to the MOBB. Glad to have you on board. Who writes, I know y'all don't like it, but here's some other nicknames instead of Capital Punishment. Uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Department of Defense. All right, the DOD. <laughs> These are so bad. Martial Law. DEFCON 1. Federal prosecution <laughs> who would name the defense federal prosecution <laughs> that's not even a cool nickname um the dod is fine i i we could get down with dod right because it's short um but if if somebody was like yo they don't want none of the dod and they'd be like yo what that stand for and you tell them <laughs> they like man if you don't go sit your dumb ass down. <laughs> you know but Yo, DOD would be cool until you got to tell somebody what it stands for, right? Um, but anyway, I digress. Uh, honestly, nicknames, the best nicknames are organically um, stumbled upon, okay? When it's forced, it's tough. They usually don't work. Um, the best nicknames are the ones that you just stumble into, like the Fun Bunch, right? Nobody's thought about that hard. They just were having fun. They were jumping up and high-fiving and, oh, that looks like a lot of fun. They're the fun bunch, right? Um, the no-name defense. Bunch of guys playing well as a unit. Nobody knows any of the individual players, even though you knew some of the names on the defense. But for the most part, there were no you know huge standouts. I can name one or two guys off that defense, Nick Bonacani, but – Still, the bottom line is you didn't know a lot of their names. The purple people leaders, right? Like, again, we can go on and on with these, the steel curtain, you know, it, it, it's organically done. We can't force it. Capital punishment had a chance to work. They blew it. You can't run it back. Once you, once you burn a nickname and it doesn't work, you can't run it back. Can't run it back. It's over. Ron M, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Ron writes, I need some Drizzy Drake May equals God's plan. <laughs> There'll be a lot of Drizzy Drake references should he get drafted here in Washington. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, and there'll be a lot of Drake references to tracks if he's nice. I know I'm going to be guilty of it. It just is what it is. But he's got to be nice first. Before we start doing that, I'm uh, not doing that until 
um, he proves to us he's worthy of any nicknames, right? Um, so I, I assume if he's the pick, there'll be a lot of Drizzy Drake references coming down the pipeline. Plenty of them. Gear Cell 1, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. My guy, Gear Cell 1, writes, I just saw Chase Young on the subway wearing a fur coat with yoga pants and patent leather sandals. Tragic. Uh, did he have a sling on his shoulder? No? No no sling on the shoulder? Fur coat wasn't covering that up? Um, patent leather sandals. I don't know if I've ever seen patent leather sandals before. That's new. That's a different one. I know um, my dad has a pair of sandals. I want to burn them so bad. And, you know, my dad's from the island. So, you know, sandals are, are a real thing. And these things are so hideous. And he loves them to death. And, and he'll shine them up with Vaseline or baby oil. And them things be glistening in the summertime. Man, them things are terrible, bro. Anyway, I digress. Tragic. Tragic. Joe Rockhead, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB who writes, with so many start-worthy free agents now on the roster, where is room for the drafted BPAs who may be ready to contribute? There's plenty of space for guys that come in and prove. Like, remember, the first thing that we were we were talked uh, we were told was that there were going to be competition, right? When Adam Peters got the job, he spoke of competition. When Dan Quinn sp got the job, he spoke of competition. That's all we've heard about. It's competition, right? None of the guys that we've signed outside of Frankie Louvu, Dorrance Armstrong, Tyler Biotish, um. And that's probably it. Our, and, and Bobby Wagner, even though he signed a one-year deal, Bobby Wagner is a made man. Outside of those four, nobody else is above reproach. Like, they're all on one-year deals, essentially. So drafting a defensive end, Cleveland Farrell is, and Dante Fowler Jr. aren't keeping a rookie off the field. He may not get as many snaps. He might not play 72 snaps if there's 72 snaps in the game, which no defensive end plays 72, all 72 snaps. But he may not, if, if there's 70 snaps in the game and your defensive ends are playing 55 snaps, he may not play 55 snaps like Dorrance Armstrong may play, but he might play 37 snaps. And that's fine. But Cleveland Farrell and Dante Fowler Jr. and F.A. Obata aren't stopping a second round or a third round defensive end that they like from getting on the field. Same thing at receiver. Same thing at linebacker. Like if they like a linebacker and they draft him, they'll find, you know, roles for him on the field and opportunities for him to play. He may not be playing a ton, but he'll get on the field. Same thing at running back. If they draft a running back, a guy that has home run threat ability, he may not be getting a ton of snaps, but he may get five or six snaps and two or three touches a game, and that might be enough. And, and if he hits a home run once every three, four games on his three to five touches a game, great, right? So, again, yeah, they signed a bunch of dudes. And a lot of these guys, you expect them to play and eat up snaps. But it doesn't stop you from drafting guys that could potentially come in here and push the envelope. That's what you want. That's how you get better. That's how the roster improves. Not by just saying Cleveland Fer Farrell's fine as your starting defensive end and moving on. Michael Davis is fine this year. You know, you can get by with that. But if there's a chance for you to upgrade that, Michael Davis isn't stopping you from starting a rookie opposite of Emmanuel Forbes. Okay. If you draft a rookie and he comes in here and he looks like your first or second best corner, guess what? He starts starting opposite of Emmanuel Forbes. If Forbes is starting, by the way, because you draft a guy at corner in, say, the second round and he comes in here or the third round 
We got three third round picks. And he comes into camp and immediately hits the ground running and they're impressed. And by week two, they're like, yo, he's the best corner on the squad. You're not going to keep him on the bench just because you have Michael Davis and, and a former first round pick in Emmanuel Forbes. No, we're going to put him on the field. Remember, this group isn't tied to any of the players that were here before they got here. So keep that in mind too. Only the best of the best that were here before are guaranteed anything. And that's the Deron Paynes, the Jonathan Allens, the Terry McLaurins, and Jahan Dotsons of the world. And even Dotson for some shouldn't even be in that conversation. For me, he is because I think he's going to end up being really good. But understand that there will be space and opportunity for BPA players that they like that come in and prove early on that they deserve to get snaps. There will be snaps. Tight end, same thing. Everybody assumes, including myself, that Zach Ertz is TE1. Let him draft a guy, and I don't think that's going to change, by the way. I don't think Zach Ertz at any point this season isn't TE1 if he's healthy. But I, I do think that John Bates and everybody else in that tight end room can get their ass pushed back one slot and be and, t- and TE2 could be a rookie that they got in the second round, that they got in the third round. I think that could happen. And there's there's space and opportunity for TE2 on the roster. Even if he's TE3 and they still like Bates more because he can block and the, the tight end that they draft isn't a great blocker, there's still opportunities for the third tight end to touch the football. So trust me, that's not going to stop them from drafting guys because there's there, you can find snaps. This isn't the NBA where you got to create minutes. And, and, and if guys, veterans are on the roster, you got to trade them away and, and, and <clears throat> to create an opportunity for your young players to play. There are in the NBA just five spots on the field. There are 11 spots on the field on offense, on defense, and in their special teams as well. You can find opportunities. You can find opportunities for guys. Jado, been a member for five months. Really do appreciate you. Jado writes, What up, Lou? What's up, Jay? Which QB fits our offense more? Um, Hard to say. We don't know what the offense is here. It's it's almost impossible to say what all, what quarterback fits the offense best here because if you look at what Cliff Kingsbury did in Arizona, Cliff Kingsbury utilized Kyler Murray's legs in his offense. He was a huge part of what they did from a uh, rushing standpoint. So on one hand, you look at Jaden Daniels and say he could be the perfect fit, but J- Jaden Daniels also has a very thin frame. Um, is that something you want to put on him? Um, and then you could also look at it from this perspective. If this is in fact, and and again, they claim that, you know, don't call it the air raid, this, that, and the third. And I agree that it's not, it's not straight air raid. Like the core principles of what the air raid was built upon, that's not what Cliff Kingsbury did in Arizona. He modified it to fit his talent. and. I expect him to do the same here, but there's still going to be air raid principles in what he does. And Drake may ran air raid in college under Phil Longo. So again, he's fully capable of coming in and running Cliff Kingsbury's offense because he ran a variation of it in college. So you could look at it from either perspective and say both of them could fit what Washington wants to do, it really just boils down to preference. Which one of these guys do they see as having the greatest upside and which one of these guys do they see long-term having um, an opportunity to win you Super Bowls and be an all-pro quarterback? And um, I don't know what the answer is. And they'll, they'll have to sit down. And there's a lot of things. You know, so many fans get caught up in the things that we watch on tape. You don't have, that's half of the equation especially when you're talking about a quarterback, you got to know if he loves ball. You got to know what kind of sacrifices he's willing to make. You got to know if he's a leader. You got to know, does he know football? Does he know, you know, protections? Does he know how to read defenses? Can you give him a play? Can you put him on the whiteboard? Is he retaining information? Is he coachable? These are things that we won't know. We don't know the story about him, his freshman year, about him doing X, Y, Z. They'll find that stuff out though. 
We don't know what kind of a locker room guy, a, a, a weight room guy, a film guy. We don't know those things. We can only go off of either what we're told. I'm assuming Herm Edwards is going to say something uh, to that effect in his interview with John Kahn, that this guy is a tireless worker, this, that. And that's cool. I, I, I take him at face value. Herm Edwards has no reason to lie to us. But we don't we, we don't know all of that information. They do have that information at their disposal. And that's going to help them make a decision that you may not agree with. But trust me, they're making that decision for a reason. It may not be the right one, but they had their reasons when it's all said and done. Spence colleagues, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being a member of the MOBB. Spence writes, Louis, love you, but Duke sucks. Ha ha, so does my Maryland. Yeah, we do suck this year. Absolutely. I wouldn't be shocked if we got bounced in the first round. I think we playing Bucknell, I think. Who we playing? Um, I wouldn't be shocked. I, I, Here's what I hope. Two things. I hope Bucknell, and, and I've seen Bucknell plenty of times to know what Bucknell is, which is why I'm scared. One, Two things I never like to see when, when it comes to my Duke Blue Devils, depending on what season it is, what year it is. I don't want I don't want a roster full of, of rugged brothers playing against Duke who are athletic. That's a problem for us. And I don't want a bunch of white dudes who can shoot. And I think that's what Bucknell ultimately is going to be. One one brother handling the rock and a bunch surrounded by a bunch of white dudes who can shoot. And if they go 11 of 23 from deep, we're going to lose. Because we can't shoot. We're inconsistent. We don't play good enough defense. There's a lot of fun things fundamentally wrong with Duke this year. But I know you were just saying Duke sucks in general because you're a Maryland fan. But um, we do suck this year. It's actually true. We suck. And so I don't expect us to go very far in the tournament. But at least Maryland sucks. You're not in the tournament at all, which is where you belong, at home. Go play some NIT basketball. Uh, Spence Kalis, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, thank you for doubling up. Who writes? Um, or oh, Grande Groove, excuse me. Sorry about that. Grande Groove, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate you. Grande Groove writes, I'm stamping it now. May the force be with us. Uh-oh, here we go. Here comes the puns. <laughs> May the force be with us. All right. That one isn't too bad, though. But here they come. Drizzy Drake, May. May the force be with us. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. That's the last super chat. You guys enjoy the rest of your evening. And again, you may or may not see me. I can't guarantee you what the next few days are going to look like. Um, I can guarantee you that I'll be watching March, March Madness basketball, college basketball, though. And so um, we'll see how everything goes. But if anything happens with this team, you know, you know, you already know what it is. But nothing is going to happen of note because that portion has really come and gone. So um, I don't expect to be super active over the next three days or so, but I'll try to leave you a few items uh, to chew on. But again, Dynamic Dave says Duke is playing Vermont. It was one of those, one of those damn teams. Vermont, uh, Davidson. Um, who the hell did I say? I said a team with a B, didn't I? They all, they're all the same. Vermont's probably got the same shit set up. Black guard handling the ball, surrounded by a bunch of white dudes that can shoot. Either way, we in trouble. We got to hope that they don't shoot it well and we come out. And the luster has worn off. Teams aren't afraid anymore. Like the, the name Duke doesn't strike fear in anybody's heart right now. We got to reinstill that fear. And that's not happening with this group. That's not happening with this group. Nobody's afraid of Duke right now. We got to go out and, and recruit and get back to where we need to be. I'm hoping that this next class coming in, we got some heavy hitters coming in. 
is going to change the game for us because this shit ain't it. But anyway, you guys get out of here. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and I will see you guys the next time on the Louis T Network. Um, until then, God bless. Good night.